Uh, before we get started, just a brief moment of personal privilege here. Um, it's been <laughs> four weeks since I was with you. I had some other ministry opportunities and some vacation. I know that many of you were praying for both of those, and I thank you for that. I want to let you know that while I was preaching at, at Harvey Cedars, I did brag on you a little bit, uh, particularly in regards to your singing. And uh, you proved me right this morning. It was just beautiful to have your voices washing over me up front here. If you haven't tried it, you might want to sit up front one of these weeks. <laughs> Thank you. I'd ask you to please open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 22. And if you're using the Pew Bible today, you'll find that on page 1051. Let's begin with a question. Have you ever had the embarrassing experience of going somewhere only to find that you were inappropriately dressed? Could have been that you arrived and you were severely overdressed or severely underdressed. But it can also be that it's not so much the formality of your attire, it's just the wrong stuff. I didn't go to college right out of high school. Instead, that fall after graduation, I went to work with the local electricians union. But I'd missed the cutoff for the apprenticeship program, and so I began working with them as a laborer. Day one, I showed up, and I stuck out like a sore thumb on numerous levels. For starters, I drove a Toyota pickup, and not a Ford, Chevy, or Dodge, American-made like everyone else had. All throughout high school, I had worked in an auto center, first for Jiffy Lube and then for Sears. In those settings, you have impatient customers who want their car done now, and so you work and you hustle. Day one, working with the union, I was given a task, and I completed the task with hustle. I wanted to impress the foreman. But instead, he says, slow down. If you keep working like that, I'm not going to have anything left for you to do come 2.30. By the way, we're working two hours overtime if you want to stay. <laughs> what? But then there was my work clothes. Again, all through high school, I work in an auto center. I have a uniform. It's Dickie style pants, a button-up work shirt complete with name patch. And my dad was an electrician. At that time, he had a uniform for the school district. Dickies style pants, button-up work shirt, district logo patch instead of name patch. And so I show up on day one in my old work clothes and my boots, which happened to be Timberland boots. And I find everyone in jeans and t-shirts and none of these guys wear Timberlands. To them, I look like a yuppie car mechanic. And at the end of the day, the foreman kindly suggested that I wear something different the next day, or the guys would be relentless in their teasing. In our parable that we're going to read today, we're going to read about a royal wedding that a king gives for his son. And a guy shows up in the wrong attire. But it's not just a social faux pas with some considerable embarrassment. He is bound hand and foot and cast into the outer darkness, a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, which in scripture tends to refer to eternal judgment, a bit worse than upsetting Aunt Ethel when you wore a blue suit to your cousin's black tie wedding. And if that doesn't seem outrageous enough, the king burns a city to the ground on his son's wedding day. Perhaps most unsettling, that king is God. Maybe that doesn't sound like the God you know, or even a God that you would like. C.S. Lewis wrote in The Problem of Pain, what most of us want is not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven, who, as they say, liked to see young people enjoying themselves 
And his plan for the universe was simply that it might truly be said at the end of each day, a good time was had by all. So what do we do when we're presented with something like this in the scriptures? Well, let's begin by recognizing that this is no less a part of scripture than John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then let's read and see what sense we can make of this. Let's do that now. Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Matthew 22, 1 through 14, this is God's word. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry. And he sent his troops and destroyed those murders and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. Praise God for his word to us. It's been about two months since we've been in the parables. And today's parable is actually the third in a series of three parables. The setting is the courts of the temple in Jerusalem, and it's Holy Week. Jesus' crucifixion is just a few days away. On Sunday of that week, Jesus rides into Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna to the Son of David. On Monday, he comes into the temple and he flips the tables of the money changers and then heals the blind and the lame. And now it's Tuesday. Jesus enters the temple courts and begins teaching and the religious leaders challenge him, by what authority are you doing all these things? Jesus says, you tell me where John's baptism came from. And then I'll tell you where my authority comes from. They refuse to answer. And so Jesus says, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then he launches into the parable of the two sons, which contrasted true and false obedience in the kingdom, followed by the parable of the tenants, highlighting the leader's disloyalty to the kingdom, and now this parable of the wedding feast, teaching that these religious leaders, the religious elite, those whom everyone assumed to be closest to God, actually have no standing and no place in the kingdom. And we need to remember three things as we approach this parable. First, the disciples and the crowds that Jesus was teaching are present, but the parable is primarily directed towards the religious leaders. Second, remember that we are talking about a parable, a story 
designed to grab attention and make one think. Sometimes outrageous things happen in parables or the timeline doesn't add up, such as a wedding dinner being ready, a military expedition, a new round of invitations, and new guests sitting down to the same dinner. It's the concepts, not the timeline, that's most important to us. And third, remember to focus on Jesus' context and intent. If we look at this parable from our standpoint, then we're going to read into this parable all the history that we know. The new guests will be Gentiles, the old will be Jews. The destroyed city will be Jerusalem in 70 AD. The first servants will be the prophets, the second the apostles and those who came after them. And while I wouldn't say that these things are entirely excluded, the repeated line in here about everything being ready, I think, suggests a present reality of the kingdom for Jesus' audience. And we don't want to miss that. With those things in mind, let's dive into the parable under the following three section headings. First, abundant grace, indifference, and insurrection. Second, free and open invitation. And third, kingdom demands. The first heading is abundant grace, indifference, and insurrection. A very literal translation of verse 2 would begin, the kingdom of heaven has become like, indicating that this is not just some future thing that will come one day and then can be compared to something we understand. Instead, with the coming of Jesus, the kingdom has broken in on the scene. It is a present reality, and in just a few short days from when Jesus tells this parable, the redemption of the kingdom will have been accomplished through his own death on the cross. The kingdom is here. Everything is ready. Are you? What has the kingdom become like? It's like a wedding feast that a king gave for his son. A royal wedding. Think incredible extravagance. But we need to unload some of our own cultural perspectives here. This isn't a presidential wedding. As Americans, fiercely committed to personal freedoms and autonomy, many of, in our society would proudly and publicly proclaim, even if I was invited, I'd never go to that president's wedding. We don't view presidents as royalty. And by and large, we have no problem publicly expressing our distaste for them. Even in the UK, it'd be unthinkable that on the day of William and Kate's wedding, the, the wedding of the eventual monarch, that the prime minister would say, yeah, it's a nice day. I think I'll go golfing instead. But it's still different. We need to think in terms of a different time when kings were absolute monarchs. This is the ultimate honor to be invited. And to refuse the invitation would at minimum raise suspicion of disloyalty. Maybe a modern reference, and maybe this is for some of the younger folks, comes from the Lion King. When Scar doesn't go to Simba's presentation, it raises suspicion, not just of his loyalty to the present ruler, but of what loyalty there will be to the king's son when he ascends to the throne. But there is also a similarity to our day. Take out the fact that weddings are crazy expensive and most cannot afford to invite everyone that they would want to. 
at its purest, what is being communicated by the sending of a wedding invitation? Come and share in our joy. And that's the invitation of God to the kingdom. Come and share in my joy. This is the reason that you were created. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit exists for all eternity in perfect unity and fellowship of mutual love and joy and glory. And out of an overflow of that, says on the sixth day of creation, let us create mankind in our image. All of creation, even into the deep reaches of space, have been prepared as the arena in which mankind was to share in the joy of the eternal God and glorify him by delighting in his love, joy, and glory. The fall into sin severed us from that fellowship with God. But his plan will not be thwarted. He calls Israel into covenant fellowship to restore the broken relationship. Come and share in my joy. And he extends that invitation by sending prophets over and over again. Come and share in my joy. All the way up to Jesus' day. And now Jesus tells these religious leaders in this story what is unfolding right in front of them. Think back to previous parables, like the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus himself is holding out that invitation to the older brother religious leaders. Come into the feast. All of heaven is rejoicing. Are you really going to stand outside? And so here's what we have. In God's abundance, Abundant grace, he has been extending the invitation over and over again to come into the kingdom, come and share in his joy. He's done it throughout the history of Israel. He's done it in these own religious leaders' lives. And now Jesus, the Redeemer, the Son of God himself, comes. The kingdom is here. Everything's ready. Come to the wedding. Come to the feast. Now, a wedding in those days, particularly a royal wedding, would be a multi-day affair. People didn't have clocks on their wall or their wrist or in their pocket, so there would generally be multiple invitations. The first would tell you what day the event was going to be, and to that you would respond, yes, I'm coming. And then there, the day having arrived, there would be a second invitation. All things are ready. Come now. So we should see here that those who are receiving these calls in the parables to come now had already been invited and had already said, yes, I'll come. They're the Jewish people generally and the religious leaders specifically. They are God's people. The believing community. Those who would say, we're on God's side. Yes, I'm coming. But how do they respond to the second invitation? Some show indifference. They paid no attention. And one went off to his farm, another to his business. And here you might think of the parable of the sower. Those who were choked out by the cares of the world, money, possessions, family, and so forth. Such indifference is the attitude of many in our own day. Most of your neighbors are probably not militant atheists hell-bent on destroying the church. Most of them are likely nice people doing plenty of decent things, going to work, providing for their families, and this, in fact, is one of the most seductive influences of the world today. 
we can get on all right with a good education, a good job, and a little hard work. They're simply indifferent to the things of God and the invitation of the gospel. As one theologian has termed it, don't lose your life by making a living. But others are militant. A wedding invitation comes to them, and they respond by seizing the messengers and ultimately killing them. These servants come in the name of the king. To kill the servants is an act of insurrection. To refuse to come is an affront to the king's dignity. To attack his messengers is to attack his throne. Can you think of something more outrageous than killing someone for inviting you to a wedding feast? What if the murderer turned out to be the bride? This wedding feast is ultimately pointing us to the marriage supper of the Lamb that we read about earlier. The bride is the people of God. And we don't need to go all the way to Revelation to find this. It's in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea. So how outrageous are their actions? It's like the bride refuses to come to the wedding and kills the attendants. And it's then that we come to the judgment. The king has these murderers destroyed and their city burned. If you pull just those statements out of context, it can look like, well, what kind of God is this? But keep it in context. This parable does not say that the kingdom of heaven is like a king who burned a city on his son's wedding day. It says the kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a feast and invited his subjects to share in his joy. And he sent them invitations, and he sent them more invitations, making very clear that all preparations had been made. There's a wonderful feast, and you're invited. It communicates a God of grace, generosity, and patience, but also a God of justice. This is not a vengeful, tyrannical God who impulsively overreacts. Those judged and condemned are explicitly stated to be murderers. This is not the arbitrary brutality of a despot, but a righteous king bringing justice to bear on murderous insurrectionists. And it is not something God takes delight in. How would you imagine Jesus' emotional state at this point? It's not arrogant. The text tells us, turn a page over to chapter 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. It's lament. But now we have a wedding and no guests, which brings us to the next heading. Free and open invitation. New servants are sent out to the main roads to invite all they meet, as many as they can find. It's a free and open invitation to the wedding, which is really a free and open invitation to the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' immediate context, think of what's happening around him. The religious leaders, the elite, the good guys, the ceremonially clean have been either indifferent or hostile. But the blind see him as the son of David. The tax collectors leave everything and follow him. The immoral woman of the city is weeping in repentance at his feet. The diseased 
The unclean flock to him. So the insiders spurn an invitation to come inside and show themselves unworthy. The outsiders know themselves unworthy, but respond to the gracious invitation to share in the joy of the king. And in this, we see that one's credentials, their resume, and their lineage are of no value in the kingdom. It is a free, open, and gracious invitation. No one has any room to boast. If we apply this to our own day, the, that invitation has gone out to the Gentiles, outsiders from every nation and tribe, an indiscriminate collection of people with no special standing. As Jesus said towards the end of the parable of the two sons, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Or how about 1 Corinthians 6 as a description of who responds to the invitation? The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexual offenders, thieves, greedy, drunkards, slanders, swindlers. Paul says these will not inherit the kingdom but then says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Three things here. First, maybe that list doesn't describe you well, but consider if we had a list of all the sins of those in this room and those listening today, every word, every thought, and deed. I don't have to guess. I know it would be a despicable list that ought to turn our stomachs. And I know that because I'm in the room. Such were we. There's no room for boasting. It's only by grace that any of us can enter the kingdom, and therefore we have no right to withhold the gospel invitation from anyone because we think they're too bad. Look at Jesus' ministry. It's all the worst people that come. Second, whether you are a Christian or not, and perhaps especially if you are not, none of us have any right to think that we are beyond the reach of God's love and grace. In the parable, it's the outsiders, those without credential, those without a list of good works or a lineage. They're the ones that fill the wedding hall. God loves to save bad people. They're the only kind that need saving. And in fact, when compared to a holy God, they're the only kind of people that there are. The invitation is extended. We respond. Third, our culture works against us in seeing the astounding free offer of the gospel. In order for this offer to be astounding. We need to see our sin and unworthiness in light of God's holiness and justice. If we understand these things rightly, then our questions aren't, why would God condemn anyone? The question is, why wouldn't God condemn everyone? Why? Would he want a relationship with me? But our culture tells us that we are all not just okay, but amazing, wonderful, and super awesome. 
And that leads to the assumption, of course God wants a relationship with me, to spend eternity with me. And the astounding free offer of the gospel is robbed. It's wonder. In this climate, we need to see that the God of John 3.16, who so loved the world that he sent his son, didn't do it because we were super awesome. And he's also the God of John 3.17 and 3.18. John 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We were bad enough to need saving. And verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. It is a free and open invitation. To use the old King James, it's a whosoever invitation. No one is beyond its reach. And we must not withhold it from anyone. Well, the invitation is free and open to come into the kingdom. That does not mean that the kingdom is without demands. And this is our final heading, kingdom demands. The wedding hall is full of guests. And the king comes in to see those who have come to share in his joy. But one guest has no wedding garment on. And the king asks, friend, how would you get in here dressed like that? He gives no response because he has no response, no excuse, and he's bound and thrown out. And this can seem a bit harsh at first glance, eternal judgment for the wrong clothes. Let's look a bit closer. First of all, note that it is one guy. Everyone else has the right clothes. So it would seem that the reason he has the wrong clothes isn't because he didn't have time to get the right clothes on. Everyone else did. Second, the servants are sent out to invite everyone, not just the rich everyone who had fancy clothes, but as many as they could find. And so it would seem that the man is not being condemned for not having fancy enough clothes. It seems more like he didn't bother to put on clean clothes. He was invited, but instead of acting like an invited guest and doing what invited guests do, he acted like a party crasher. The summer after Mary and I were engaged, we went to a wedding of a good friend of mine from high school. The reception was held in the the ballroom at the Holiday Inn over by the Turnpike. And the dance floor is poppin'. And then we, and by we I mean the groom and some other friends from high school, noticed some people at the open bar that we don't know. And it's particularly peculiar because they happen to be in their pajamas. (laughs) They're random people staying at the hotel who thought they'd come on their own terms and take what they wanted. Now, most of the friends were were not believers. They'd made a few trips to the open bar themselves. So this came quite close to some weeping and gnashing of teeth. (laughs) Those people didn't come to share in the joy of the wedding. They did not honor the couple or the family They took advantage of the open door and came as joy robbers. Now, I, on the other hand, behaved like an invited guest. I participated in the ceremony, honored the generosity of the hosts with gratitude and shared in their joy. But while I was invited, if I don't behave like an invited guest, if I dishonor the bride or the family, I might still be thrown out. That's kind of how it is in the kingdom here. 
And so here you are. You're in church on a Sunday. And unless you were drug here against your will, you have in some sense responded to a kingdom invitation. The invitation to come to church is not just an invitation to come sing some songs and hear a guy talk for a while. It's an invitation to the kingdom. Come to the feast. Share the king's joy. And here you are, in the midst of God's people, among the kingdom of God. How should you act? Really, how should you live like an invited guest? Well, the wedding garment concept can be helpful. We read earlier from Revelation 19, where the wedding garment was fine linen, bright and pure, and the fine linen was the righteous deeds of the saints. But there's also an earlier heavenly picture in Revelation chapter 7 of God's people and the Lamb, and the people are dressed in white robes, and we're told they're the ones who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And taking both concepts together, the, the garments, the life of those in the kingdom, begins with the righteousness of Christ, received by grace through faith. We trust in his completed work and his righteousness, not our own, to bring us into the kingdom. But now that we have responded to the free and open gospel invitation to the kingdom, we need to behave like invited guests and not party crashers. So there is a righteousness that we produce or the fruits of good works. The mention of a necessity of good works can be very difficult for many. So let me be very clear. We are not talking about some kind of standard of perfection or merit that you need to accumulate. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We're saying that before someone comes to Christ, they are dead in their sins, alienated from God. They're outsiders, even enemies. But in the gospel, there's a gracious, free, and open invitation that's being proclaimed throughout the world. Many, even all, are called. But then it says, few are chosen. And I would adamantly believe that I am correct in, in my understanding. This word few does not mean a tiny number. It's really a matter of translation from the Hebrew or Aramaic Jesus spoke to the Greek Matthew wrote into the English that we're now reading him. Few here just means less than all. The banquet hall's filled. So you responded to the call. Those who respond in faith are, are now not dead in their sins, but they have new life in Christ. And I believe that you can have assurance in this life that you are among the chosen. And it's this simple. Have you trusted in Christ and not yourself in responding to the invitation of the gospel? And are you striving to live like invited guests and not like party crashers. You know what? Invited guests still spill glasses of wine on themselves or on others. They get bits of food on their tie or their shirt. They get green things stuck in their teeth. They might split their pants on the dance floor, break a heel or get a runner in their stocking. They came to share in the joy of the host. They express gratitude to the host and seek to honor and praise the host. 
and all those things, the foibles, but the, the heart to strive to live like an invited guest. That's what the Christian life looks like. So let me briefly summarize everything in five quick bullet points. First, the kingdom is still like a wedding feast. The invitation is still going out, and the job of extending that invitation is ours. And we must not withhold it from anyone. Second, do not allow the distractions of this life to keep you from the joy of the eternal kingdom. And do not allow the climate of our culture to rob you of the astounding grace of the gospel. Third, the kingdom invitation is free and open, but this parable teaches that we cannot have the kingdom on our own terms. This is what lost the religious leaders and the man with the wrong clothes. They're standing in the kingdom. Fourth, live like invited guests, not like party crashers. But take this out of the arena of weddings. Those who respond to Jesus in faith are sons and daughters. Jesus accomplished everything. Our obedience is not to earn the love of a father. Rather, we obey because we have a father who already loves us. Live like beloved sons and daughters. Finally, all things are ready. Are you? Come and share in the king's joy. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word that you've given to us. Thank you that we can look at it together today. Lord, open our eyes to see just how astounding the amazing, free, open, gracious invitation that we've received is. It, it's so much different than even just being invited to a wedding. Help us to never lose sight of that. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and the things that are above. Lord, we pray that we would not be withholding this invitation that, that we've received from anyone. Lord, but make us willing messengers who go out and gather all we find. Work in us by your spirit that we might live like beloved sons and daughters, like invited guests to your glory, for our joy and the salvation of the nations. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.